Hey y'all, it's Erica. I hope you enjoyed our episode on Sojourner Truth. I loved doing the research for this and was completely inspired by her strength and resilience. If you haven't listened to the whole episode yet, please do so now. This supplement is just a little dessert, a sweet little extra at the end of a main course, but it will have spoilers. You've been warned. I'm about to tell you an incredibly convoluted story. As you may know, with most cults and cult leaders, the reality of the situation is shrouded in mystery. Mystery from us, and honestly, mystery to the followers, and often the mystery of (laughs) the cult leaders themselves. So we're opening with Robert Matthews, who I'll refer to for the rest of the episode as the Prophet Matthias, because that's the alias he used while he was running this ridiculous escapade. He played religious hot potato into his early childhood. So he was raised as an anti-burger Presbyterian. And then following several bouts into itinerant preaching and following these itinerant Baptist preachers, he finally proclaimed that he was in fact not a Christian at all, but was of Hebrew descent and therefore was Jewish. He took on this new moniker, the Prophet Matthias, after a visitation from the Apostle Matthias. Now this is the one who replaced Judas after the betrayal. I don't know that that's significant, but it's a nice little nugget. The Apostle Matthias allegedly told him that he was his descendant, and this horrible calamity and utter destruction was about to befall Albany, New York, where he and his family resided. And like Sodom and Gomorrah, he was instructed that he must flee. Well, his wife Margaret was less than convinced by this celestial visitation and said, Nah, I I don't think I'm going to flee from my home. And Matthias pleaded with her to join him on this religious pilgrimage. And after two failing businesses and a bankruptcy, she was out. She was like, I'm not doing this. You very clearly are not all there, Matthias. I'm done. So she stayed in Albany with her kids, and Matthias went on his way. Shock of all shocks, Albany did not burst into flames, and she did not turn into a pillar of salt. Anyway, about this time, Matthias met Elijah Pearson, or for our purposes, Elijah the Tishbite. Elijah was also a merchant raised in the Presbyterian faith who held incredibly staunch views in favor of entrenchment and religious perfectionism, which basically means he was completely insufferable and lived a life of extreme asceticism in which, despite being relatively wealthy. He decorated his home with bare wooden furniture, no lavish decorations, no really even comfort. He and his wife Sarah were heavily involved in evangelistic mission work in New York. He was a profitable businessman, he was involved in church, and was doing mission work. Sarah, his wife, died after just eight years of marriage though. And it's reported that the reason she died was from malnutrition and overwork in direct correlation with their lifestyle. But alas, I don't have the coroner's report, so I can't verify that. What is known and well documented by friends, family, and followers is that this is the moment where he declared himself Elijah the Tishbite, reincarnate, and commanded his wife to rise from the dead. But while he proclaimed himself Elijah, she was no Lazarus. She, to no one's surprise but his own, did not rise from the dead, not even hours after him berating her lifeless body to rise up. And this is where our two religious extremists slash snake oil salesmen meet. Matthias convinces Elijah to use all of his wealth to fund, quote, the kingdom a religious foundation and commune for those of like faith. Elijah acquiesced, and so the kingdom was founded. In addition to Elijah, the Folger family were deeply involved in the kingdom and functioned as Matthias's financial backers. Matthias was happy to spend their money in finery that came with the wealth that these men had so denied themselves. And when he appeared in public, Matthias wore, quote, 
A black cap of leather shaped like an inverted cone. A military frock worn of the best green cloth, lined with pink or white silk and decorated with gold braid, frogs, and fancy buttons. Ruffles at his wrist and a black cravat. A fine silk vest and a crimson sash that he also wore around the house. Green or black pantaloons and depending on the weather, sandals or Wellington boots highly polished and worn outside the pants. He wore the fine two-edged sword that came from capital him, so God, who was first and last, and he carried the iron rod with which he would rule the world. Yeah, needless to say, this guy had an ego. Let's put it this way. Have you ever met someone who wore jackboots that wasn't a villain? It is something to consider. And while it sounds like a fashion travesty to me, that's just this chronicler's opinion. And you may be wondering, Erica, you've taken us down a long rabbit hole. What on earth could this have to do with our girl, Sojourner? I can hear Caroline's voice now. Rabbit holes aren't pithy, Erica. What are you doing? But this is where Sojourner arrives. She is newly freed and looking for employment, and who should need it but this religious family? She worked as their domestic servant at the Folger Estate. It seemed that she did grow dissatisfied with the work what was meant to be a job split between folks at the kingdom rested solely on Sojourner's shoulders. But she's no wimp. She carried on and continued working. About this time, blackberry season came upon them, and they had gathered a whole basket for dessert. And all of our main players, except Matthias, partook of these berries. But only one fell ill. Elijah the Tishbite. And Matthias convinced him that Almighty God would heal him. And he did not need modern medicine for this to happen. Completely convinced of this. Totally convinced by his faith. Elijah went to bed. The next morning, he was dead. And lo and behold, he had been poisoned. Now, who is a perfect scapegoat for the murder of a wealthy white man at a religious commune? Hmm, I'll give you a second. Oh wait, you don't need one. It's the black domestic servant who had complained that her job was a bit more than she initially signed up for, dot dot dot, right? Thankfully, the court saw very, very racist and very thin evidence to support this claim. She was accused, but acquitted of the murder and turned around and sued them for slander or libel. Sojourner had been down this road before, like we heard in the episode, when she used the court system to win back her son. What is one more turn in the courtroom to show she was innocent yet again? She said, and I quote, I know the truth, and I shall crush them all with it. Talk about a poetic, powerful, and prophetic statement. She won this lawsuit and was awarded $125 compensation, which would be about $5,000 today, which is not too shabby, especially given the circumstance. While who actually poisoned Elijah is a mystery, one thing is for sure. If someone asks you to join a religious fanatic cult, you should probably say no. And that, my friends, is that. Join us next week for another tasty episode and a delectable small bite. But don't worry, blackberries are not on the menu. I'm Erica, and I'm pithily yours. Hey, pithy listeners. As you know, Isabella Baumfrey, or Isabella Van Wagenen, was Sojourner Truth's legal name. So, this court case, it's very difficult to find. But just be aware... <laughs> If you look it up as Isabella Van Wagenen, you get a little more headway. If you're fact-checking us, and we certainly hope you are, just keep that little knowledge nugget in mind. Thanks, you guys, and I hope you enjoy this fascinating small bite.